Good day and welcome again to A Place Call Through where we broadcast from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. I am the host of A Place Call Through. I am evangelist Patricia Wade Goings. I'm the author of a book, Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. And I am also your health and wellness and your life coach. You know, one thing that we do here on A Place Call Through, we share real stories real stories of real people who have gone through, been through, and still trying to get through. And we do that to inspire you, to encourage you, and to empower you with life lasting lessons. So we thank you for joining us today at A Place Called Through. And we hope truly at the end of this and other broadcasts that you have truly been inspired. Today's guest is gonna share with us again, a life lasting story of her trials and the tribulations that she has gone through and things that she's still going through right now. So we wanna just share with you our guest today, Ms. Blossom Rogers. We welcome her to this place called through. Welcome, Ms. Rogers. Hey, how you doing? All is well, blessings and love to you. Uh, God, we're so delighted glory. that you are here with us today. And we're gonna go ahead and jump right on into this today. And we know that you've had, you know, one lifestyle that led from one thing to another. And, you know, it began for you real early, you know, um, being a, a daughter of someone, a teen mother, you know, and you moved on with your grandparents. But one thing I want to share with our listeners and viewers today is a little fact about child abuse, because you endured that early in your life as well. And a lot of people, you say, well, oh, well, what? I already know this, but you never know everything. So we just want to give you this little tidbit. Child sexual abuse, it is an, a sexual act with a child by a parent, an adult or someone who is older and often and most times more powerful than that child. It involves being forced, bribing and threatening and pressured into a child, pressuring a child into sexual um, acts. But I want to share something else, too, with our listeners and our viewers today, and then we're just going to go ahead on in and we'll have this dialogue together. It's known as 24-7, Apple Jacks, Crunch and Munch, French Fries, Prime Time, Jelly Beans, Product, Coke, Rock, Snow, Blow, White, Two, Nose, Candy, Base, Flower, and Power. And that is the story today that we'll be talking to Ms. Blossom Rogers about her life and where she has gone through. So Ms. Rogers, if you want to begin with us, you know, early in your childhood, you know, your parenting, your, your, your family was going through some things. And so as a child, well, you also endured several of those hardships because of family relationships. So talk to us about your parents a little bit, if you will. First of all, I give God all the glory and the honor, and I ask that he uh, show you and your team favor for allowing me to come on the platform today. Um, God, is good. I, God is good. God is good. And one thing about me, I'm not ashamed of nothing I've been through. Um, for 19 years, I was on crack cocaine. But God, I have 17 years clean. Uh, God has blessed me. I'm the author of four books, From Under Bridge 1, From Under Bridge 2, And They Laugh, and When They Laugh. And I want you to know we have two kinds of laughter. Are they laughing with you or at you? Okay. Uh, and I had a lot of people laughing at me 17 years ago. Um, book one tells you uh, the first part of my life. And then book two is the second part. But book one, I talk about how I went through molestation. And um, it's two things that people don't like to talk about. Molestation and mental illness. And God delivered me from both of them. Um, and the reason that I wrote the book is not to hurt anybody, it's to help somebody because everybody's going through something, you know. Um, I may not be going through what you're going through and you may not be going through what I'm going through, but I pray that my story be able to help somebody. Um, like I said, when I was raised, we couldn't, whatever happens in the house stays in the house. And uh, as we know, we're just as sick as our secret. Um, going through the molestation that took my childhood. And for anybody who's uh, been through that and don't want to talk about it, in order to heal, you're going to have to hurt. You're going to have to feel that hurt again so that you can heal. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but long as you keep covering it up, shoving it up, hiding it, it it's not going to help you. 
you know. Um, so I, uh, my, well, I was raised by my great grandmother, and then I went to go live with my mom and my stepdad and my other siblings. So that's where all the uh, abuse happened. There. Can you hold it right there? I want to go back to a point um, because you did know in previously that you were raised by your um, your grandmother, but there were some things that led to her being the mother now figure. So can you talk to us about that, and then we'll jump back into your life, uh, you know, living with your grandparents. Yeah, well, with my grandma, with my mother, she was a teenager when she had me. And, you know, with older, with uh, African-American generation, the uh, grandparents always take the child. And so that's what happened with me. Um, first time I had, uh, took a drink, I was five years old. Uh, my great-grandmother was raised, if a child has wing worms, you give them beer to kill the wing worms. So you know how some children fall in love with a horse on a merry-go-round or a parade. Well, I fell in love with a horse on a can of Colt 45, you know. Uh, as we know, it didn't kill the wee words, but I know I used to feel all wo woozy and woozy, you know, uh, and then realize I would be a drunk every Sunday, you know. So, but she she did what she was taught. So, um, and I love her to death. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't get to see me get clean and sober, but I know she would be proud of me. Um, then I went to go live with my mother and my siblings on the... Um, we, you know, one thing I want somebody to know, abusers don't grow up saying they want to abuse a child. Something had to have happened to them in order for them to inflict that on us. You know, hurt people hurt other people. I, and it's not that I'm taking up for my, my stepfather. Um, and I still love him because he raised me. But I was got I had got to the point where I was trying to defend and prove that these things happen. But I'm at the point now um, long as God know and I know, that's all that matters to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I also talk about in my in book number one how um, I got pregnant at an early age. You know, I'm thinking that if I got pregnant and I had the baby, you know, the God was going to take me away from that. But as we know, a baby don't keep a man. Um, I also talk about how I got married at an early age. I was 18 when I got married. My first husband was in the military. So I said, oh, money, travel, I can get away from it. But as we know, we cannot run from our uh, um, problems as well. So like I said, um, come in. So like I said, um, I also talk about how um, I got with the guy and he was already smoking crack cocaine. And I don't know why we think we can change people when it's hard changing ourselves. So um, that's what occurred, you know, because he had started beating me and taking my money. And I said, well, if I can't beat him, I might as well join him. Um, so, but before you got to that point, let's back up again, because you were separated from your mom to go live with your grandmother for a while, correct? Right. And so then later on, you were reconnected with your mom? Yes, yes. Okay, I went to live so with her. Okay, when you went back, is that where the um, sexual assault began at? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, so the yeah. sexual assault, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about your book in the second half. Um, but we want to give our listeners and our viewers, you know, your information, and then we'll go back and let you explain how it is written in your book. Um, but I want to go ahead and put these facts out here so they understand, you know, your story that you had gone through so much, which led into the marriages, you know, uh, and the other facets that have happened to you. But there was a separate a time of separation with you and your mom. And so when you were reunited, you know, as this family unit, there was some sexual assault that happened to you. And most cases of sexual assault, that person who's doing this attack, they usually threaten you or, you know, and you're so you get to the point that, oh, well, I'm not going to tell. And in some cases, you know, you say to them, yes, I'm going to tell. And in your case, if I'm understanding this, that yes, you made that statement that, oh, I'm going to tell, but then the person that was abusing you responded in what way? Right, right. Um, it was one Saturday night. I remember um, my mom's was gone somewhere. I can't remember where she was, but we were home with my stepdad. And I remember he, um, he had just got through touching me. And I remember saying to him, when mama come home, I'm going to tell her. And um, I still remember the way that he laughed at me. That's why I said we have two kinds of laughter. Are they laughing with us or at us? And I remember him saying she's not going to believe me. Well, that's what occurred, you know, because when you're dealing with a generational curse, you know, our generation, my mom's generation, 
um, my great grandmama. So, you know, it, and I feel in my spirit that God has raised me to break that generational curse, you know, because my great grandmother, she got pregnant at the age of 13. So um, nobody, it can't help you heal if they haven't healed. I don't know if that makes sense or not, because it does. my mom was, um, she was raised in New York and my mother's um, boyfriend at the time molested her at six. And she finally told me when she was 66 years old. So she held that secret in for all the years. But we have to realize we're just as sick as our secrets. Um, and like I said, it wasn't my secret anyway. It was my stepfather's secret. So um, just, but you got to be ready to be able to deal with the people talking about you. And, and my family, like when the books came out, my family was not happy at all. You know, uh, a part of me was scared. The other part was happy because I had a book out. My family stopped speaking to me um, because of that. But I, just like I told my old gal, I called my mom my old gal, um, that I had to do what God told me to do because it's not about them. It's about helping somebody else. Um, she, my family, um, some of them still call it the book, but uh, I just had to let them be and stay where, where they at. As long as I continue to keep doing what God told me to do. That, that's where I'm at with the book. And that, that's your mission in life, you know, to do right. what, what God is telling you to do. But, and also your mom, she was a, um, she was a teenager when she got pregnant as well. Right. Yes, ma'am. She was, so, and that was a generational thing too, you know, the girls. But see, God stopped it with me because I had all boys, so I didn't have to take care of no baby. So he said, God said, no, she ain't gonna do right. So I'm gonna let her have all boys. But you got pregnant at the age of 16. Right. Okay, and that was and my your first pregnancy. But you yes. had gone through all this sexual, you know, sexual abuse, um, you know, from the various family members. Right. And but I, you know what? I got pregnant on purpose because I wanted something to love. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, you because when you're being abused, it, the abuser is telling you it's your fault. You're bad. You know. And I remember I used to try to make my stepdad feel good, even when I was in school. I would make people laugh. I, I, I was a class clown because I wanted to make people laugh because it made me forget about what I was going through at home. You know? So, okay, point here. You had siblings though. So were they being abused as well? And no. what were their reactions to your being abused? Did they know this was going on? No, they didn't know. I didn't tell nobody until I was 18. So okay. I, you know, I kept, but now don't get me wrong. I was in um, cheerleading, Baseball, I won Miss Congeniality in a, in a beauty contest. I was doing them things, but I still had that dark secret. So it's but not that like was your you, cover up. That was the way right. that you covered up what was actually happening to you. And that is one of the known factors too in you know sexual assault and sexual abuse that you tend to to hide those factors. And I just want to pause right here because if there's anybody that's listening to this and you're watching this, get the help that you need. That number is 1-800-422-4453. That is the national hotline for child sexual abuse. Please call someone, get help. It is important to you and your life, actually, that you get this help to help you process. So Ms. Rogers, before we go to commercial break, um, was there ever a time where you had a confrontation as you grew older with the men that sexually assault you, did they say anything to you? Was there any apologies for this? Um, no. Um, uh, um, to this day, he's never. Uh, he still don't admit to, that he did it. But one thing, I, like I tell everybody, anything that we do for the Lord, it's gonna last. Uh, there's no way that God would continue to keep open doors for me to tell the same lie. Um, and I, I've gotten to a point I don't defend and prove no more because I know what happened. I, I know who did it. Um, even like with my great grandmother's house, you know, she used to have borders because she had uh, her husband worked on the railroad. So she had borders there in the house. And I remember I was like maybe four years old. And I remember my grandmother had a long haul. And I used to have one of them 10 cars, the real heavy car, get a paddle. Cause she wouldn't let me go outside to play, so I had to play inside. And I remember passing the middle bedroom and it's got um the guy was laying on the, the second part of the bed. And back in them days, you did what an adult told you to do. You couldn't say no or nothing like that. 
And so I remember him coming, telling me to come into the room. And I remember him, I didn't know at the time what he was doing, but I, he was exposing himself to me and asking me, did I want to kiss his worm? You know, so as a child, you did what you was told back then. You know, you just didn't tell them no, or I'm going to tell. My, back then, they would just take the top of your head off if you went and told something. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing. Don't let them, nobody in the house while they're gone. Don't tell nothing what goes on in the household. Don't get my food out. That's what we were raised on. You know, so I'm, I, I, I had to break that cycle. And you did. Well, we're going to take a break for our commercial break, and we'll be back and we'll conclude with Ms. Marshall Roberts, her story on addiction and sexual assault and the there as there had she had gone through. Once again, this is Patricia Way going hosting on A Place Called Through from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. 80% of women will develop a pelvic health condition at some point in their lives. There is relief. There is hope. The Pelvic Floor Store, your resource for personal health. Welcome back to A Place Called Through. And again, we're broadcasting live from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. I am your host, Patricia Wade Goings. And today's guest is Miss Blossom Rogers. And we've been talking to her in the earlier part about sexual assault and the addiction to drugs. And so now we want to talk to her, continue on the journey with her in her place called Through about how she got addicted to crack cocaine. And what happened after that addiction? And we'll discover through this addiction, the miracles and the blessings that have flowed upon her life and others. So welcome back to this place called Through Miss Rogers. And we wanna pick right back up again with you being introduced to this new world of crack cocaine um, and the sexual assault that happened to you that resulted in you now becoming an early mom as well. So if you would mm. tell us about the young guy that you you actually fell for, you know, with and, and made all these promises, he made all these promises to you. He was going to do A, B, and C, and then everything collapsed from there. So take us yeah, to that well, point where now you, you met this guy and yeah. he promised you, okay, it's going to be okay. Yeah, and I fell for it. But you know what? I got pregnant on purpose because I, I, I wanted something of my own. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. But, it, you know, when he, he never knew what I was going through at home. I was scared to tell him. Um, but, and I knew he loved me. He loved me in his own way. And we would talk about a baby. Um, and I thought that the baby would uh, keep him. But as we know, babies don't keep a man. And I don't know, it was just like, you know how little girls have that fairy tale, you know, dream. Uh, they live in a white house, and the prince gonna come on the white horse. And, well, I lived in the projects, so he was gonna ride in on a, on a, a bike anyway, you know. So um, they these guys had just came in from New York. It was six brothers, and uh, I just and I remember telling my friend, "I'm gonna get him. I, that's, that's gonna be mine." I remember saying that, um, and I got pregnant. But as we know, you know. He backed out. So my mom, you know, she, uh, you know, had to pay the hospital bill and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he had other girlfriends while I was in school. I remember we had a uh, dress alike day and him and his girl, they walked down the hall dressed in the same colors. And I, there I was eight months pregnant, about to tear the whole school up, you know. Uh, but I tell, I tell people, you know, it's, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change nothing I've been through because it's making me the person that I am. Um, once I got pregnant, I ended up like two weeks before we were supposed to get married. He left and went to back to his, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and he married the, uh, his uh, high school girlfriend and they're still together to this day. But her and I are best friends because when I was out there smoking crack, she stepped into the place where I was supposed to be in with my son, but she never talked down to me. She made sure that the daddy did what he's supposed to have done. So when I, you know, uh, a lot of people don't get along with their their kids' stepmom, but her and I, we have a bond, and and I love her to death. So like I said, that that worked out years later. Um, and then you was, moved on to other relationships, you know, yeah. one step. So, so what uh, were those relationships going, like? 
And I was going to different relationships because I was looking for love because my childhood had been snatched from me. Um, I had became a people pleaser, uh, which we have to be careful of that because you know what I know, everybody's not going to pat you on the back. You know what I'm saying? So um, I ended up going with this guy. I met him at the club and um, I had heard that he was smoking crack. But I, when I realized it, when he started beating me and taking my money, because I used to think, I don't think like that now, but I used to think that if a guy didn't beat you, he didn't love you because these are the things that I saw coming up, you know? So um, we, that's why we have to be careful of things that we do in front of kids because we, they're little sponges. So I've seen a lot of that coming up. So that's why I thought that he loved me. And so um, I'll never forget it. He didn't want to teach me how to smoke crack cocaine. But I wanted to fit into his world. So I remember um, Gladys Knightley was coming to Daytona for a concert. And I had some money. And I was going to buy some tickets. But he didn't want to go. So I told him, I said, well, if you want to, we'll buy, you can go buy some crack. And you'll teach me. So he went. And uh, the first time I took that first hit, I remember I started hyperventilating. And he had started throwing water on me. And, and then so I had to take another hit. And then. Because I remember saying to him, okay, okay, I'll do it right this time. When I should have stopped. But, you know, curiosity killed a cat. And um, the second time, I was off, off to the races. And, uh, so by me doing that, that meant that, you know, because I was 23 with three kids. Um, had been married to a military man. Left him once he left the service. So I guess I was just trying to... I lost my. You were really searching years. for love, as you said at that point. You were searching for right. someone to care about you at this point. Right, right, right. And so that's how I got into abusive relationships because I was thinking that if a guy didn't beat you, he did not love you. But like I say, I do not think like that now. I do. But you, you can't re-raise nobody that's already raised. You're either they're going to be there or they're not. That's that's it. That's just how it is. And then the thing is that because you, you know, you felt as though, I, you know, he made you believe that, okay, this is the way to go because he knew, you know, how easy it was to persuade you to do what he was doing. And there was one thing that I noticed that you had mentioned, you said that um, it was like, you know, if I can't beat him, I'll just join him. Right. And, and that was the mentality that was the beat down that he, you know, he actually persuaded you that, okay we got to do this here together but then on the flip side of convincing you so then he walks away and then this leaves you standing and put you into other situations where you know you went into rehab trying to get yourself together mental institutions you've been in prison for this you became homeless and living underneath the bridge in your car all of these things and your kids having to now go back and live with other family members so that you could get yourself together. But in that search, this is you're going through, you're searching for identity, purpose, right. and trying to find your way to freedom. So right. you're going through meant to you at this point here that you have to now fight and fight for a reason and for a purpose. And now we come to that purpose now that you have fought through these struggles, you've gotten through all these hurdles. So how, how do you encourage someone who may be struggling and going through these same things that you went through? I, I tell people that they gonna have to go through the hurt to heal. Um, I had to, you know, relive the stuff I had. First of all, I had to admit that I did some stuff. It wasn't all on the molestation that I ended up under a bridge because I did a lot of things out there I had no business doing. So what, you know, whatever you sow, you shall reap. Um, and you got to get real with yourself. If you can't be, if I can't be real with Blossom, then I can't be real with you. Like I said, I'm not ashamed of nothing I've done. I did everything out there, but slept with an animal. And, and I'm going to tell you, it was on crack so bad, I would have slept with it. If the dope boy said, Blossom, I'll give you an ounce to sleep with that dog, I would have. That's how bad of a crackhead I was. Um, am I ashamed of it? No, because I know that wasn't me. But you know, when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. So I was, I was around people that were smoking crack. That's so that, that's the output I was getting. Um, been to prison, 58, 99, 31. That's my prison number. I had that number for the rest of my life. It's just not a functional number. Um, with my kids, they didn't hate me. They just hated the things that I was doing that I was doing. You know, these were, 
I got all boys. So they didn't want to hear nothing about what their mama was out there doing. Um, so not, now I have a relationship with them, but it took some time. It, it, it took some time because, you know, it didn't take no one or two years. Because let me tell you one thing. I maybe didn't sexually or physically abuse them, but mentally I put them through a lot because I was a pop-up mama. One minute I'm here, next minute I'm gone. They wanted their mama, but I didn't know how to be a mama. You know what I'm saying? But then you I, got I to a point in your life, even though you didn't know how to be a mother, you did one thing significantly that turned all of this around for you. There was a moment where your cry for help was a little bit deeper and you may not have expressed it to anybody, but you did something really significant that said, okay, you surrendered. Your yeah, life was I, done. I had to. Um, and then I backslid, you know, I had joined the church. Uh, God bless me. I just, he had beat a case for me. I was facing nine years and I was ready to go back to prison because I couldn't do no probation. I wasn't finna report. I wasn't finna pay the people. And my mom's like, you can do it. I was like, no, I'd rather go back to prison. So I was like, nine back then, I did five. But God bless it. I walked out of this scot free. I went, I started going to church, was doing real good. And then I started going with this Jamaican. And um, as we know, if you go back around people, places, and things, you're going to start back doing the same thing. But I remember I was in a crack house in Daytona, and I still had the clothes that I had on that night, shirt, shoes, and purse. And I, I remember I had a piece of paper in the purse, and I started writing God a letter. And um, I remember the girl came in, who apartment we was in, to give me another hit of crack. And she, it, I told her, I said, you know, next time you see me, I'll be clean and sober. And she laughed. Um, this time when I was getting high, I had been up like two weeks. I was just really, really tired. And um, I still was writing God a letter, take another hit, write some more. And I remember I put the stem down and I walked out the dope hole and I checked myself into the hospital. Cause I had to start robbing people. I had to start being the driver for cars. Somebody was gonna kill me or I was gonna kill them. That's just how bad it was. Um, like I said, I'm not ashamed of anything. You know, I have some friends that have went ape that can drink or they, can, they have went back out in the street. I don't have a comeback. If I go back out there, I'm dying. So I don't, I don't need to put on a lab coat to try to go and experiment anything. Um, I don't mess with wine coolers because wine coolers will take me to a beer, then to alcohol, then to crack cocaine. Uh, so once I got to the hospital and they ch uh, checked me in, uh, one of the nurses, she asked me, she said, Blossom, are you willing to be re relocated? I said, yeah. So God sent me to, to Miami. And um, once I got down there, but I said, the, the games that I played in Daytona, they'll kill me down here. So I had to get right. Um, went through inpatient, stayed, did my outpatient. Um, I went back to school, became a, a national certified medical assistant, got married again. And that's how I ended up here in Alabama. Now I tell people, we still gonna have life issues. Now this is my ex-husband's hometown. And when we got here, he started messing with other women and brought another woman in our home. Well, back in the days, I was kind of crackhead if a bird died, I was going to get high, you know? So I had to really cry out to the Lord because the enemy was trying to destroy me. And um, God brought me through that divorce. Uh, first time buying a home, I lost that to a foreclosure. God still kept me. Uh, brand new car, I lost that to repo. God still kept me, but I'm still clean and sober. 17 years, uh, no co no no alcohol or no cocaine. Uh, God bless me now, I work for the University of Alabama. I work in research dealing with drugs and alcohol. So everything I went through out there in the street is getting to be prepared for what I'm doing now. Well, you um, want to share, I want to make sure, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but I want to share because we're running out of time, but I want you to take like a minute and a half and share with our listeners and our viewers you know, you, you, you've been redeemed, you know, you surrendered. And so now you've been through and you're encouraging people through the works and the things that you do. And roughly, again, well, about a minute and a half, share with them um, your books and how they can reach out to you for more information about you um, and connect with you because you're a woman of many talents. You have truly blessed us today with your testimony. Amen. And I'm sorry that we are running out of town, but I want to give you that last minute and a half before I have to close about how people can connect with you. Um, they can reach me on Facebook, Blossom Rogers, or you can give me a call at 
753-8164 or send me an email, B-L-O-S, the number two white at yahoo.com. Um, like I said, the books are at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, but if anybody get in touch with me, I'll send them free copies of the book. So it's called Planting the Seed. And for anybody that has been through what I'm going through, if God did it for me, he'll do it for you. Don't give up. It's called perseverance. That's 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 just wonderful. And one thing I want to close with is that your scripture, you said you believe in the scripture, Jeremiah 29 and 11, and paraphrasing it, stating that no, no matter what your past looks like, God has a great plan for your future. God has brought truly Miss Blossom from under a bridge to drive over the bridge to her dreams. Stay tuned for more from Miss Blossom Rogers. She will be back as she shares the glory of God and how he has truly been blessing her with multiple programs. We're sorry that we have run out of time, but we would like to invite you back maybe and talk about your books a little bit more. And you got another program coming up that you're working on in the Habitat for Humanities that you're building a building now. So we want to get you back. But unfortunately, we're out of time. And I do want to thank you, Ms. Blossom, for being here with me today on this place call through. Again, we're broadcasting from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. I am your host, Evangelist Patricia Wade Going. I am your life coach, your health and wellness coach, and the author of Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. If you like this story and others that you have heard, or maybe you have a testimony, please reach out to me in area code of 843-608-9744 or by email at pgoingswp at gmail.com and follow my website for more information on Ms. Blossom and others at www.willpowerthecalltorisebuff.org. It has truly been my privilege and a blessing today to be with you. God's blessings and love to you all.